Okay, so while we have a break, let's take a look at some student questions from last week. Uh, the first one is, hey, what's wrong with you? Uh, caucus. Uh, the ones that have a ball-like shape, uh, yes, uh, it is. And one of the examples was uh, Staphylococcus. What are some other examples from Caucus? Uh, on the internet, I was able to pull out this uh, as a... Excuse me. Yeah, was there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, good job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, 저 교적이 여기 없을 거예요. 제가 이미 옛날에 해서 찾기가 힘들 거고 그냥 저 미국에 있을 때 그냥 계속 뭐좀 어. 제가 다니긴 했는데, 예. 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 아, 그런 거는, 아, 그런 건, 예, 관계 없고요. 예. 예. 예, 알겠습니다. 감사합니다. 예. 오케이. 아. So these are several different uh, varieties uh, of uh, carcass, more like a shape. So the one, so, Last week, I uh, named the one example of the Staphylococcus uh, because that's very famous and one of the deadly bacteria, uh, one super bacteria, uh, is a member of the Staphylococcus. Uh, another that uh, ex uh, famous example of a Caucus bacteria that occurred to me is a Streptococcus, uh, which appeared on the general biology textbook a lot. It's a, Strepto. Strepto means in chains. And in that particular case of streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae is a pneumonia causing uh, bacteria. So that's another uh, coccus, the example of coccus that I can think of is um, this one. Yeah, the uh, what of the format, what would be the format and timing of the final exam? Would it be like uh, same as the, the midterm exam or not? I, uh, quite honestly, I haven't made a, a decision yet. So I will let you know soon. And a uh, bigger problem is I haven't finished. And uh, more honestly, to confess you, I haven't even started grading your midterm exam. <laughs> so that's the problem. So I have to quickly finish the grading uh, your midterm exam so that I can have an input over whether uh, if the uh, the outcome, the result of the midterm exam is uh, uh, the scores are well spread over so that I can uh, distinguish those who are the well performers and the poor performers using the previous format of the midterm exam, then I might continue the, the, the old format of this midterm exam. If not, then I have to try a different one. In this case, the actual in-class final exam is. That's what I will have to do it quickly. Maybe uh, within uh, several days, I will yeah uh, do it and then uh, let you know. And, but trying to take a very small sample uh, size uh, poor, what do you, uh, without uh, disregarding this, the actual midterm exam outcome, which one do you prefer, at least for you to be here, which one, like previous take home exam format or in class, conventional in class exam format, or would you prefer as a final exam? What about, what do you think? Take home? Why? Why did you prefer take home? Because it's easier to cheat? No? But why then? 
can I can I hear some particular reason that you prefer the take home exam over the conversation? Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. That's actually the reason. That's the reason why I actually try this take home exam. But if many of you actually uh, have, uh, felt the same way uh, as I did, uh, that would be really great. Uh, just so I have more inclined to, okay, should I just keep the, uh, the, the take home exam format? I have a kind of uh, feeling. But decisively, I will let you know uh, soon whether I'm going to do it. And if for some reason, if I decide to switch into the, the in-class exam, that the exam date, the final exam date will be June 16. Yeah. So that uh, should be uh, answer to this particular questions. This is DNA. Uh, so for this bacteria plasmid thing, please. This bacteria plasmid thing, this is bacteria chromosome, which is still circular, although this is long so that they are all tangled up, but still it is a circular one. And plasmids are very little tiny circular uh, ones. And this is a cell membrane type of thing. And so this student uh, still have uh, some problem of in understanding the uh, link relationship between the plasmid and the insulin that I had an example of using this plasmid in genetic engineering in previous week. How about this? Okay, this is another the figure that I uh, took it from uh, general biology textbook uh, figure. So here, let's say this is plasmid. I, I, only one plasmid was drawn in this figure to simplify, but you can isolate this plasmid. And in nature, plasmid is basically uh, DNA, the same DNA. So this DNA, we can cut this DNA in wherever we want to. We do have actually a weapon, very convenient wep weapon that we can use here, like a scissor-like enzyme. We can cut it this. And also we have some the glue-like enzyme. We can, we can paste these two fragments of DNA together. Uh, so that's the beauty and power of this molecular biology. With that, also with the discovery of this small plasmid DNA, in other words, in, in between we can insert any different DNA fragment. For example, this black part of DNA represent the DNA from human, for example, eukaryotic DNA. You can cut this particular area of the human DNA and place this particular DNA into any appropriate position of plasmid. That's what we call the cloning, DNA cloning type of thing. So this fragment DNA can be anything. So in that particular example, that was insulin, human insulin gene from first to the last part of the human insulin gene was isolated and then placed in the middle of this plasmid DNA. So now it become part of this plasmid DNA. Now you put this engineered version of plasmid back into the original bacteria. Now inside of the bacteria, this, the insulin gene, is recognized as a part of this plasmid gene and now handled as if this was bacterial gene. So RNA was made 
and protein was made, and that protein, which is insulin, was what we needed. And since this plasmid copy can become up to 5,000 copies in a single cell, and the same clone of bacteria bearing this 5,000 copies of this engineered recombinant plasmid can become something like billions in a small volume, we can easily economically efficiently produce insulin was the example that uh, this question how nuclear pore how can nuclear pore control uh, the in and out of the material across the nuclear envelope was the question and for that, let me give you this particular figure that I took it from internet. Uh, so this is a simplified version, but it can provide the essence of how it does. So this is a, a nuclear envelope membrane, and these two nuclear pores uh, are uh, here. So the, through this pore, outside of the nucleus, from cytoplasm, the red ones are all cargoes. Usually the cargoes are proteins. And each cargoes, to enter through this pore, some particular protein must be engaged here. IMP standing for importin. See, import. IN usually for protein, for all those proteins, usually IN uh, proteins and names ends with IN. So import, the protein that functions in importing the things. Okay. So with, together with the importing, they can enter this is nuclear uh, pore. And to get out of, to get out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm, then what? Guess what? The protein that handles this export, right? So exporting, yeah. This exporting will recognize and then bind with this particular cargo and then get out. So this is how very simplified version, the cartoon, to illustrate the ins and outs. So bottom line is some specialized proteins are needed to control the traffic uh, between nucleus. Although, although these pores are like, they're not really picky. So anybody with a decent size can enter and can get out, but still some specialized proteins needs to be involved is the answer. Does collagen that like the proteins abundant, uh, allegedly abundant in the pig skin, yeah, improve our skin? That's what, uh, isn't the reason why you consume so much uh, pig skin? Yeah. But anyway, there is a controversy actually, right? Uh, everybody knows that pig skins uh, has uh, so much uh, the collagen. So uh, if we eat a lot of pig skin, then we may be able to improve our skin uh, condition. But consider this. This is a collagen structure. So as I mentioned earlier, Collagen is a long, fibrous, rope-like protein, which resides in outside of the cell. And moreover, this collagen is made of three different such long rope-like uh, collagen monomer, and they assemble more fibre-like 
big structure polymeric collagen. So this is a fibric collagen. And the reason why we have uh, so much collagen protein outside of our uh, usual tissues is because this collagen fiber can act as a spring like uh, uh, try to provide some strength and then flexibility in such area, the space. So if we eat this collagen in the form of food, what would happen? Can this whole collagen fiber be transferred back to our skin as intact as it is? Probably not. What's, what's involved? Once we take some material in the form of a food, all of them will go through in the form of this process of digestion. Isn't it? So, this collagen fiber will be degraded like eventually into the individual amino acid. Proteins are all made of individual amino acids. And our process of digestion, oh, yummy. Yeah. Kidding, kidding, never mind. Go on. Uh, what is amino acids? There is no guarantee that once they are all degraded into this individual amino acids, there is no guarantee that this amino acid components, once they used to be uh, components of a collagen, there is no guarantee they will just put back to. Uh, assemble collagen again in our uh, body. It's all up to whether you can generate more collagen or not. It's totally up to our what? Gene. We do have our gene, which is responsible for making this collagen protein. It's totally up to them. Individual, this component, have no thing. Is basically, so that's why, for example, if you try to move this whole big fiber of collagen, uh, they are not going to be absorbed. There, is no, there are no uh, particular transporter uh, allowing this collagen transport into the respective area of tissue or cells. So we have to degrade and then digest and degrade them into individual components and they uh, once, once they do that, they lose their integrity, their characteristic of a collagen. So that's the dilemma. But, but there is a but, but. Still, some marketers uh, advertising their collagen powder or small collagen, they still advertise that some small fragment of collagen can be directly absorbed and then go to can go to the area that this collagen can uh, effectively uh, be used. But still, that collagen should be very small, very tiny, small fragmented collagen, which are quite different from the original big collagen fiber. So still, we don't know. The bottom line is we do not know whether uh, those collagen in diet can be effective well, if so, how much effective uh, still uh, there's no, but basically from what we know about whole uh, basic biology, uh, what we can say is uh, no, there shouldn't be any effect. But still, you never know because still all these life sciences is still uh, in the, largely in the area of shades of gray. That's why we cannot definitely uh, say anything about it. Uh, RNA and DNA uh, and plasmid are uh, all can uh, like influence on the gene activity. The simplistic answer is yes. Whether it's a plasmid or actual chromosomal DNA, they are all same DNA, uh, the genetic material. So uh, whether they are uh, in the form of a small, tiny, circular uh, fragment or in the big part of the large, long uh, chromosomal fragment, still, uh, if they do have genes, they will have their proper respective 
function in the cell. Uh, emotions also the result of a cell activity. Oh, what else? Yeah. Or maybe the spiritual, spiritual activity. I'd like to believe, but uh, there is no evidence that I can believe so. So for now, unless we can only say that, yeah, emotions are also some result of the inter, some particular interaction of the uh, particular neuron cells. So emotions are made by brain. Particularly some part of the brain that uh, is called the limbic system uh, is the one that has been known as responsible for creating some of the emotion. And brains are all whole lump of different neuron cells. So these are basically connectivity, the cellular activities. In that way, we can say, of course, emotions are the result of cellular activities. Yep, I like this uh, cartoon and these ambitions. Uh, I like. I will support whatever, uh, whoever this ambition. Famous biotechnology research, great. Yeah, let's keep going. Although in these days everybody wants to become a medical doctor, and this is not only uh, in the case of uh, this country alone. When I was there in the United States and then have a teaching class. Uh, that particular classroom was for special honors biology course. So the, all those, the students attending this particular classroom was somehow some the uh, elite students there. Uh, and when I asked every one of them, hey, what do you want to become? And doctors or lawyers? So there in the United States also, most of the students wanted to become either doctors or lawyers, and obviously, for obvious reasons, for financial reward. And probably so in this country too. Uh, too many, too many youngsters, too many students simply want to uh, go to medical school to become doctors. But that should change. That will change. So actual uh, researchers, scientific researchers, uh, the job as a job of a uh, scientific researcher will uh, soon become a very attractive uh, and ideal also job in the near future. It's, that's what I believe. For some reason, reasonable reason. Okay. Uh, in the textbook, although chapter six deals with some membrane things, but we cannot really dig in uh, another membrane and signaling uh, with only two, two more weeks of a lecture left. So I have decided to switch into uh, some major, major topic that I believe uh, which is more important. Actually, that's a, my own ego-centric reason. Uh, because I'm a DNA guy. But anyway, so this chapter, in this chapter, we are going to take a look at the nature of the genes and the genes activity. So from genes, uh, what is produced? Eventually, the ultimate product of the, any particular gene would be protein. And uh, what's the relationship and how this activity is being controlled? Uh, and uh, what happens when this control uh, fine tuning mechanism uh, has uh, some defects in the form of a mutation uh, is basically what constitutes this chapter. So let's see. Uh, so let's try to distinguish the two different genome and gene. Yeah, I guess. Almost everyone knows what genome is, but let's just uh, uh, to double check. What is genome? How is it different from gene? Anybody? Genome is this, and gene is what? This? What is this? 
Some of the genes, whole, total, whole, whole thing. Uh, when you put, this is another rule of uh, naming perhaps things in this business, uh, I guess. So gene is what? Singular, individual. Yes. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Gene is an individual thing. Gene is an individual thing, where, uh, whereas genome is O-M-E. Whenever you put O-M-E in the end, that indicates the whole thing, whole. So genome means the entire genes present in a one particular organism or one particular individual is what uh, defines a genome. Okay. So this genome, in Korean, genome is translated into this, the entire body. Whereas this gene in Korean is this merely this, isn't it? Right? So that's the difference. Gene versus genome. So this OME thing can go further. So not only uh, being used in indicating such whole gene sets, but also it can be used in indicating whole entire, for example, hey, how about proteome? So the protein is individual protein versus proteome. It's the entire proteins in a single individual or in a given kind of organism. It's a proteome. So not only this proteome, but also how about this? Metabolome, O-M-E. Metabolite, metabolite, some small chemicals that produce uh, as a result of a metabolism is a metabolite. So this is individual component, the metabolite. Metabolite. But metabolome means the entire, everything, entire metabolites present in a given individual or kind of organism. So why there are so many new terms keep popping up? Because these days is the era of omics, genomics. Genomics as a like a branch of a study. Genomics means studying the entire genome. Genomics. Proteomics. Yeah, studying. You're not only studying only one single particular uh, interesting protein, but you are studying whole protein profile. Proteomics. Metabolomics. So these are ear of omics, like when I was still in the graduate uh, school, whole atmosphere of all this uh, area is one at a time. So everybody, every graduate student uh, wanting to become a PhD in the future, uh, like has some brainwashed that one particular protein or one particular gene that he or she picked uh, was the most important gene in the whole world and then only studied that one alone. And after getting the degree, PhD degree, and then for the rest of his or her entire career, 
uh, he or she kept pursuing that only one single gene or protein. That was the kind of atmosphere uh, or trend or the way the scientist used to work. Things has changed drastically these days. Omics. You pick only one and then study, and then you realize, in the end, you realize the limit of what? The reductionism. Nothing can be answered because of this whole complexity of interaction. So now you move into this omics. You look at everything as much as possible at once. It's the called philosophy of the omics. Because no matter how you study one particular gene or the gene's function in the form of the function of protein, in detailed function, that in reality, it does not give you any uh, reliable, practical answer. Because in real playground, it behaves differently. So to compensate, uh, to solve such a drawback, these days, usually the approach is like trying to look at the whole thing is, yeah, when we deal with this genome, uh, that's why actually uh, we get to see more and more terms like the genome proteomes and metabolomes like in these days is one thing. And now, what else? So this human genome, like consists of about three billion base pairs, if you know what I mean. Nucleotide, we have three billion different nucleotides in pairs. So actually the number of nucleotides we carry is six, more than six billion nucleotides. Yeah. It's a huge amount of information. For example, like if this each individual nucleotide were like put in, in as if it was a, like alphabet in a book, uh, in a 12 font size, probably the page, number of page would uh, well exceed the 1 million different pages. So if you try to read from the first page to the end of this page, it will take how many days to read the 1 million, more than 1 million pages of the book? That's actually what they did, not we. That's what they did in 1990 in, under the uh, Human Genome Project to read from the first nucleotide to the last nucleotide of this 3 billion nucleotide. And no wonder why it took 10, more than 10 years to finish that in terms of the technology. And more surprisingly, in these days, it will take only uh, two to three weeks. Jesus. Then in 1990, it took more than 10 years. Still, that was done by so many, 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 many different laboratories in the United States, as well as in Europe, in and even in Japan. Uh, working together, okay, uh, sharing their load of work to finish this, uh, identifying each different alphabet of our genome. But now, one single laboratory can finish this whole thing job within two or three weeks these days. We are living actually really, really scary world these days. So anyway, we have 23 chromosome, 20 is 46. I have already went through this. Okay. So 2n equals 46 means our diploid chromosome number, isn't it? So uh, if we convert this thing into our haploid number, n equals 23. Okay. That's the convention. That's the conventional way of describing any genome of any different organism, for example, like yeah, I love, I love uh, retriever. But anyway, this Canis lupus uh, familiaris is a dog. 
dog serum equals 2n equals 78. Although, 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 although human, the actual human genome size and the dog's the genome size in comparison is very similar. So probably their nucleotides is something like a similar to 3 billion uh, nucleotides, but their genome can be described like, uh, unlike ours, it can be this uh, is described as a 2n equals 78. What does it mean? 2n equals 78 versus 2n equals 46. Hmm? They have more chromosomes, but if their genome size is similar to us, that means their average chromosome size is smaller than ours. They have more fragmented, divided chromosome. This is like a straightforward way of describing such chromosome number versus genome size. So like this fruit fly genome is n equals 4, 2n equals 8. They have only four different chromosomes, very small. But surprisingly, they actually their number of genes are only half of what we have. So surprisingly, many genes they carry. We do have, we can bo boast 20, 30, 23,000 genes, different genes. So oh, we are human on the top of this whole this evolutionary uh, the <coughs> hierarchy. So this miserable, primitive fruit fly should carry how many? You have uh, only about 1,000 genes. Oh, it turns out that they carry something like a uh, 20, I mean, 10, uh, 15,000 uh, different genes. Wow, that's a lot. And actually, that is the reason validating that we study this fruit fly. By only l l studying this fruit fly, we can learn a lot about us because there are so many genes, so many genes of a fruit fly can match to uh, what we have and so we do not have to study our own genes for many uh, occasions. This is a model uh, plant, although this weed like a very tiny uh, plant, but this has been, uh, this served as a one model exemplary uh, plant genome. So this was the one that actually, for the first time in, in plants, whole genome was uh, uh, sequenced and so many so many, many, many uh, valuable information had been learned from this particular plant. It's named called the Arabidopsis. And me also happens to uh, work on this Arabidopsis in my laboratory. And it's corn, N equals 10. You can keep going on. Tiger, N equals 19. Wow. And lion, 19. That's why the hybrid between tiger and 19. Uh, Lion uh, can be possible. Uh, so hyena, on the other hand, n equal 20. No wonder why hyena and lions are always like a, such a fierce, uh, hated uh, enemies. Joking aside, horse, 32 chromosome, haploid. Donkey, 31. That's why donkey and horses cannot produce viable offspring. Chimpanzee, on the other hand, 24, luckily. If chimpanzee had a 23 chromosome, maybe even some hybrid between chimpanzee and human might have been possible, some, in, at least in terms of the sheer chromosome numbers, but it's not. And you may think actually, uh, the more you have in terms of a chromosome number, you may be actually considered as a more evolutionary advanced, but Think again, because this butterfly chromosome number is freaking 200, something like 25 in between. So many chromosomes. Okay? Although that doesn't mean that their genome size is huge. It only means that their genome is highly fragmented into different chromosomes. But another example is some primitive organism has a, a astonishingly large genome several times uh, as large as ours. So uh, 
not necessarily. The more you have genes, that means you are more advanced. No, that is not true either. But anyway, okay. So, this is very straightforward. Uh, everybody uh, should know by now, relationship between gene and RNA and protein. If the DNA is a kind of information concept, okay. so I compare like uh, one, one day I compare the DNA as a cookbook recipe. Okay. So entire book recipe, each page describing what kind of particular different dishes can be made. And RNA is one particular page information. So RNA is a copy of DNA, but the different thing is only not entire DNA, but in the case of RNA, only small part, small part of the DNA uh, are made copy into the form of RNA is the difference. That's how we can compare the roles of DNA and RNA as uh, the entire cookbook versus one particular page of such instruction, the recipe is uh, RNA and DNA. Like, for example, think about it, DNA. If DNA is the entire cookbook recipe, and this, you, this is what you have, only one, as a one single valuable precious copy. So every time, every different time, if you want to actually uh, have some uh, cooking exercise of a particular uh, kind of dishes, then you go particular, you visit particular page and then, hey, I want to make today pizza. Okay. So can I bring this whole cookbook into this oven? And then your answer sh uh, should be usually what? Hey, what do you think? Are you crazy? This is a really precious copy. Get a copy, stupid. So you get the Xerox copy of a particular page describing only how to make pizza. That's RNA. So you have you have a whole bunch of different genes. Okay? Each gene uh, can be considered as a particular instruction, particular recipe. Okay, and each recipe you can whenever you or, or depending on your particular need, you can use, you can take, you can rent uh, or check out. What kind of uh, expression? You can check out that particular recipe only in the form of RNA. So that's how you can uh, compare this RNA as a copy of DNA. Yeah? And usually when you make copy, you are not making only a single copy. If you the the money, the money is not limited and also the, the copy paper is not limited, then usually you want to uh, generate multiple copies of the same uh, page. That's how you do it. RNA, when an RNA is being copied from a particular area, that the gene area, then you generate multiple copies. Something like a hundred, sometimes several thousand copies are generated out of a single area of the gene. So, and up until now, these two are simply information, the information, the concept, but actual tangible thing. So this is a, the difference be, between the pizza recipe versus actual pizza that you can eat and enjoy. You can feel it. You cannot feel pizza recipe, but you can feel pizza. That's the difference between RNA and the protein. So by reading, by reading this recipe, RNA, in the, encoded in the RNA, you can convert this information into actual real protein. That's the relationship between RNA and protein. And once you make this protein, then this protein can actually now uh, do, generate some function. They can change our life. Uh, is probably yeah the <coughs> explanation between these two. So 
What's DNA? And like, uh, we can define this DNA as if like a long chain of organic polymer or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And, and, uh, should I? Yeah. So DNA double helical structure all made of this particular uh, nucleotide. These things are so famous. But uh, let me just briefly go over this anecdote because this is uh, kind of really uh, in interesting and important. So the first actual clue, uh, although we these days we uh, usually basically give all almost the entire credit to Watson and Crick as the one who like ident identify correctly the entire DNA double helical structures, but actual the first clue. Uh, came from this lady's work, uh, the Rosalind uh, Franklin. This is the data, uh, the uh, so-called X-ray crystallography. The same uh, techniques that can visualize, uh, that can have any clue about protein structure too. Okay, although it is a kind of a version of a more primitive, simple, uh, simpler version of this data. But anyway. Uh, this whole data indicate DNA exists in the helix form. Whether this helix is a double helix or a triple helix is not really clear in, at this point. But she, uh, or she didn't, did not have any, uh, advanced, any stereotype or presumption. So she wanted to, uh, figure this thing out by actual experiment. So she kept doing this more and more X-ray crystallography measurement, uh, out of which uh, obviously she's got more and more exposure time uh, from this X-ray, the dangerous X-ray. And then eventually she got cancer. That's why she had, uh, had to have such a short life. Uh, but on the other hand, Uh, these two gentlemen, Watson and Craig, happened to have, uh, work, happened to have worked in the nearby laboratory, uh, of what Rosalind Franklin had. Uh, actually, this Maurice Wilkins was the, uh, boss of Rosalind Franklin. And they had some kind of, uh, like, presumptive idea about without any uh, particular, some strong hard evidence, scientific uh, experimental evidence, they just thought a DNA uh, should be double helix, some kind of their own logical reasons. They thought DNA should be uh, double helix, not a triple helix. So instead of a performing experiment, experiment they uh, jumped right away onto building the model based upon what their uh, belief. And then they tried to assemble, they were good at chemist, uh, chemistry, so they were able to uh, put correctly. Although they had some trouble uh, in near end, but miraculously they were able to solve. Anyway, actually the reason why they uh, were able to begin this kind of model building is because of the uh, initial data of this X-ray crist uh, crystallography data that indicating that DNA at least exists in helical form, the original data, was actually stolen from him and then handed over to these guys without uh, any knowledge of the original also of this, uh, this data who is uh, Rosalind Franklin. So, the data was stolen. He sneaked this data and then uh, presented it to him. That's why actually he uh, became on a core recipient of a Nobel Prize. Actually, he did not do anything but simply uh, stole the data to give him. <clears throat> so anyway, so that's how they were able to correctly build. There was a really, uh, but still. Uh, such a great uh, work. And thanks to that, we were able to recognize 
DNA is a generating material, not the protein, but DNA is a generating material. And so, yeah, uh, without trying to give any uh, discredit credit to their work, but at least the original credit should uh, go to where the actually the credit is due, who is Rosalind Franklin is what I'm trying to say. Another uh, peculiar thing about uh, this, they won a Nobel Prize several years later, and this is the only, the first and the last incident that any Nobel Prize went to the work uh, that was not ever done any single experiment. They did not do any single experiment. For any other Nobel Prize winning work, uh, these scientists should have done several uh, tremendous efforts over experiments and failure and then confirmation. But this was the only case uh, that these scientists did not even uh, uh, have any single experiment. But simply, they thought about it and built the model, and then the, the model fit perfectly well. And that was really great. So, and the reason why uh, probably a lot of you already know, uh, the reason why she was not included in one of those uh, recipients of this Nobel, particular years of a Nobel Prize, where the, these three gentlemen has received, is because that Nobel Prize was awarded after her death. Uh, that was the only reason. If she were still alive back then, probably she would have been and should have been uh, included as a one co-recipient of the Nobel Prize too, of course. Um, okay, so the gene is here. What the sentence try to uh, convey is gene is something that is a combination of only four different nucleotides. So one may think that DNA only this four arrange the DNA nucleotides defined a uh, particular uh, gene as a particular area. So actually that's one of the reasons why in the beginning, like in 1930s, 1940s even, uh, majority of the scientists believed that like when they discovered the structure of a chromosome, chromosome consists of half the DNA and half the proteins. And what do you think? Which one would be actually the gene? You have protein and you have DNA in the chromosome. Now you know that chromosome is the genetic material, but which one? DNA or protein? And most of the scientists, of course protein. Why? Protein is made of 20 different amino acids, whereas DNA consists of only four different kinds of nucleotide and genes should, in nature, characteristically speaking, gene should be able to display what? Variety, diversity. And how can only four nucleotide combination can generate enough diversity, variation? But protein, I think, with 20 different combination of 20 amino acids should be able to generate enough variation. So that's why most, most scientists believed that okay, protein should be the genetic material. But several, several lines of experiment uh, showed against that uh, notion. Oh no, DNA is the genetic material, but still strongly st stereotyped scientists, no, wouldn't allow, uh, accept such uh, the new idea. No, you must have done something experimental wrong, kind of. Uh, Stereotype, but but then when this Watson and Crick present this DNA structure, then everybody has to accept. Oh, if the DNA structure was like this, yeah, there is no way that we cannot deny D 
DNA as genetic material. That is the something that really very special feature of uh, DNA, the vehicle structure. So anyway, with only this four different nucleotide with arrangement, you can keep increasing the number of nucleotides. So the number of different ways of generating different sequence is tremendous. So still, uh, our genes have not reached to this uh, maximum limit of uh, that this combination of four nucleotides generate variations. So, so still we have a long way to go is the thing. So now the question is, what is a gene actually? We just keep thinking of gene, 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 and the chromosome. So now uh, let me ask you, so if the DNA is the gene, are all DNA in our genome the gene? No, it's not. Only small part of the area on the DNA act as gene. And some other rest of the area simply is sitting there doing nothing. They are bum. Is what is being so we do have about twenty three thousand genes, but we have more than three billion nucleotides. So if all these nucleotides are used as genes, the number of genes, uh, either number of genes should be uh, more than 23, or at least the average length of the genes should be something like 150,000 base pair at least, on average by calculating. But it turns out that it's much far less. So only average length of the gene is only 30,000 genes, which means not every part of the DNA serves as the gene. So we can simply designate some different areas on the chromosome. Oh, someone, I forgot. In the last week's question, someone just put the question and then I don't really understand the, uh, the chromatin, the difference between chromatin and chromosome is, okay, uh, using this diagram, let me uh, explain once again. Chromosome is highly condensed like this structure, but if you pull out each condensed form, then you can eventually isolate this individual thread like DNA. So DNA is a gut condensed and in the highly compact form is what chromosome uh, is all about. But if you just uh, disentangled and pull individual such condensed version, then you can isolate individual thread as a strands of DNA. That's probably the extreme case of a chromatin extreme and versus uh, extreme case of a chromosome is. So let's say, let's take a look at only chromatin uh, stage. So some area of this chromatin serve as a gene and another area serve as a gene, but in between we call as an intergenic region. Uh, there's nothing. There's no, so, so like space, some important information as a, like a recipe. If this is a recipe containing page of a cookbook, and then some blank space pages or some meaningless garbage uh, pages are inserted in between is what probably we can uh, say or think about this gene. So definition. Actual real definition of the gene, uh, there are two different versions of the definitions of gene um, are here. One classical definition of the gene is
Okay, first. First, we have to go climb back to the actual the era of Mendel's uh, taking this opportunity. Uh, we can <coughs> we can have a, a view of this classical genetics. What has been <coughs> started from Gregor Mendel. Okay, so this classical genetic point of view, the definition of the gene is. So this classical genetics is also called transmission genetics. So this transmission genetics is a classical terms of old genetics. Uh, according to that classical view of genetics, genes are the factors that determine these characters. What's characters? There are two different terms regarding these genes. One is character and the other one is trait. There is a character and there is a trait. Can you distinguish the difference between character and trait under the such classical uh, point of view of genetics? Uh, one example, eye color. Eye color is determined by genes, obviously, right? So any gene, uh, let's say we have a gene responsible for determining eye color. And then that would be one particular character, eye color. Eye color determining character. But under the eye color, you can have several different variations. Black eye, brown eye, blue eye, yellow eye, white eye, red eye. It's just up to your wild imagination, or it's a different variation of this different eye color, would be trait. So the character is the top title. On the, each character, you have several different variation, each of which we call it trait. But the problem is both Character and the trait, if you look up the dictionary and try to translate character as well as trait in Korean, unfortunately, character, you look up the dictionary, then character is this. Oh, then what about trait? Look up the dictionary and then again, this. Oh my God. But there is a really big difference between character and trait in original terms. But somehow we failed in delivering correct the translation here. So the character is a big thing. One, each individual genes can be considered as a character. I call a gene character. Human height determining gene, although several factors, several different characters are actually determining one single uh, character as a human height. But anyway, let's say. So there are so many different characters, each of which uh, is usually determined by a single different gene. But why then you consider, think of this, why each character generate several different traits. If you think about the eye color, probably you can answer. Yes? Yes, exactly. Like, but this whole character and traits were the terms that coined by Mendel originally. 
when Mendel coined this character and trait, obviously uh, his version of answer was not like yours. Something totally, uh, something that we cannot understand because he didn't even understand what actually really the gene is. Without knowing, without having any clue, he considered this character and then each character, fortunately, he was very extremely fortunate that each different character, he was able to identify only two alternative traits. He, ex he had an experiment on garden pea plant, like for example, the plant flower color, purple or white. There were only two different versions of the, like flower color is one character, and he was fortunate enough to identify only either one, this or that, or part, the P, part shape, round or wrinkle, two only versions. So this alternative, uh, and then it was extremely convenient for him to have a clear cut experiment uh, out of which he was able to uh, have some very crisp and correct idea about genes. That was the uh, beginning point for the modern genetics. Although at the time there was no ideas about, no concept about DNA, chromosome, not even chromosome, but he extremely correctly was able to predict this, the behavior of a chromosome segregation during the sexual reproduction, gene reproduction. Anyway, so, uh, we don't have any uh, intention to go into that classical details of genetics, but simply want to have this concept identified, the character was straight as she uh, defined here today. Character is a gene, then trait. The reason why we have many different versions of trait is because of this mutation. DNA, character is a DNA, a gene. Gene can have a variation due to mutation. In other words, all this character is the result of a gene, and gene is made of what? DNA sequence, nucleotide sequence, and this nucleotide sequence can change due to the mutation. And if you have this change in DNA sequence, then you can potentially have a different different version of the gene, each of which can be recognized as different traits. This is the thing. So, we are diploid individual. Right? So, in a given, a person, any person, everybody, human in particular, every human, uh, and the uh, adult human, uh, even child, are deployed, right? So, as a person, we can have only maximum two different traits for each character. Follow me? You have one chromosome. Let's say this eye color. This eye color gene lives here. This is the particular area on the chromosome, this particular chromosome, whatever it is. Let's say this chromosome number 12 or whatever, okay? And this particular location is where the eye color gene is okay, present. So you have this. Do you have another copy of this eye in yourself? Yes, right? Why? Because you are diploid. So as a diploid, you do also have another chromosome. These two chromosomes are called what? These two particular chromosomes is, are called what? What kind of chromosomes are they? Did you forget what? Homologous, exactly. Homologous chromosome. Why? Because one, you got it from your father. The other one, you got it from your mother. 
but the same chromosome. So here, you do also have exactly the same location of this homologous chromosome. You have eye color. So since you are diploid, that means you have only two homologous chromosomes, so no more. So you have only two different versions of eye color gene, two traits. So it could be this, your father's side may present the black eye. Your mother, the same equivalent eye color gene. Maybe the trait is a little bit different, so red eye, let's say. Now you have a conflict. What kind of color will you have? If you have this kind of a mixed up, if you both your mother side and father side uh, chromosome uh, inherited you the same trait as a black eye color, you don't have any problem. But if your mother side and father side have a different version of a different traits on the same character, now you have a conflict. In this case, it's easy because always a mother wins, so uh, you, you as a child will uh, take red eye, right? Is that right? Or how do, you, how do you decide in this case? This is the question. So you have two, maximum two different. It could be the same kind, or sometimes it could be different, depending on your circumstances. But no matter what, you have only two different, maximum two version, two different version on each particular character. Why? Because you are diploid. If you were triploid, then you could have maximum three different traits as an individual. But since you are diploid, you can have only two. Yeah, get it? However, Regarding this particular eye color gene, how many, theoretically speaking, how many different traits can be possible to exist under this eye color trait? How many? Limitless, theoretically. Any DNA sequence change can potentially become another new trait. And DNA sequence can occur random along with this particular def, uh, defined area. So any change uh, occur it can potentially uh, present new variation. So for each particular character, number of possible variation as a different trait so Theoretically speaking, limit list. However, no matter how many variations can be generated, the kind of variation as a trait, different trait, you can carry as an individual is only two because you are deployed individual, right? So this is what we are going to summarize, like for the part of this classical Mendelian genetics here. Genes, all genes are located on chromosome, right? Genes are on the chromosome. And the particular location, particular location of genes on given chromosome is called locus. Locus is a location of a gene on the chromosome, simply. So uh, it's not something that I'm going to ask you what's locus uh, in, in my exam or anything like that, but uh, in genetics, it's like, uh, like everybody routinely say, hey, locus, what's eye color locus? or um, insulin locus, or hemoglobin locus. That's what the location of the gene, the particular gene on the chromosome. And here you have a three different locus, so it's called the loci, it's a plural. Loci is simply plural of locus, okay? Now, that's easy. But what about this here? 
you have homologous chromosome. So this is the same like the, the case that I was uh, uh, about to bring up. So particular same locus, one is yellow and the other one is orange. It could be eye color or anything. So when these two locus indicate or represent two different version of a trait, then which one? Like in, in case of eye color, so like one is black color, uh, black eye color, the other one is brown eye color. So have you ever seen any individual having one left eye is black and the right is uh, the brown? Although, yeah, there are some occasions, cases that due to some other genetic defects, but that's not usually uh, how it happens. So each different version, if different version, which we uh, identify as a trait, in terms of genetics, it's called alleles. Alleles are different alternative version of character alleles. So alleles is equal to trait. Get it? So as a diploid organism, you have a maximum two different alleles can have. Two different. Here, what you see is a two different alleles. Not the same alleles, but different alleles. When you have, on the same location, when you have the same, exactly the same type of allele, then it's called homozygous. When homozygous, you don't have to worry about. Everything is the same, though. So the character, which is being defined, will be determined by the same kind of allele. So the case closed. But when these two alleles are different, which we call the heterozygous. It's a problem. Which one? Which of the two will win over the other one? So one, the one in this heterozygous status, the one allele which will over and then expressed outside is called dominant. And the one which hides itself Although it is there, but we do not detect because it does not show up. It's called recessive. So here is one kind of a little easy to commit misconcept about dominant and recessive. Some people consider dominant as a superior and recessive gene as a, uh, inferior. No, it is not. Simply it is a matter of which one try to show up and which one try to be like to become introvert. Hey, I will just go home and then uh, stay quiet. That doesn't necessarily mean I am inferior in, in its ability. So genes dominant and recessive is in such a way. But more importantly, actually the mechanism the molecular mechanism of why certain genes are dominant and why certain genes are recessive. What I mean, why certain traits, why certain trait of a gene is dominant, whereas why certain trait of a gene is recessive. If you can understand, then that will be probably the take home message of today and then you can go home. So does everyone understand why certain trait is dominant and why certain are not and uh, why certain are recessive. If you understand, then you can go home. Let's say Okay, uh, it's not here. So I have to explain my wording. Sickle cell anemia. You still remember this sickle cell anemia? The mutation? Sickle cell anemia is a mutation occurred in what? Hemoglobin gene. Okay. Is this recessive or dominant? Recessive? How do you know? Because 
when in the heterozygous status, this sickle cell anemia does not show or does not affect. In other words, well, as long as this, I, I hate to this call this as normal, but as long as the normal uh, copy of this hemoglobin gene is there, this effect will be hidden. That's the definition of recessive, right? But my question is not asking the definition, but why? Why is this recessive? Give you an example of a brake, car brake, car accelerated and brake. Okay. So let's say we have a car, but uh, as a deployed, you have uh, two copies of a brake, let's say, in your car. While driving, one such copy of your brake Broken, it's broken. But as long as the other copy of a brake is functioning, your car has no problem. Whenever you need to stop, you can stop it. The other one, the other copy of brake is out of order, but it doesn't matter. That's the definition I mean, of this recessive gene. So can you now explain then why this is recessive? Still, that brake has lost its function. But still, the other copy of this brake is functioning. So as long as the other copy is still functioning, that function can override or compensate this. So in other words, all these recessive genes are in nature, in terms of intermolecular nature. They were there due to the loss of the function, original function. Let's say you have original gene function, like hemoglobin, carrying out oxygen. But unfortunately, mutation occurred on this gene now, but the outcome of this mutation uh, is resulted in the loss of this original function. You cannot perform any function now. It's useless. But luckily, you are deployed, so, you still have another functioning copy of the gene. So this lost function doesn't count. Still, you can rely on this functioning copy, and now you consider this as an idiot recessive. You lost your function, but still OK, uh, as long as I have this heterozygous and it's still another copy is functioning, so I can ignore you. Is the I mean, the reason, the mechanism of this recessive gene. Any recessive gene. So once you understand this recessive gene, now you can even predict. You have a mutation. You have a mutation in the gene. And once you know the nature of this mutation, you can even predict whether this gene mutation will act as a recessive or dominant. If from your knowledge, that if this mutation will lead into the loss of this gene's function, oh, then you can correctly predict that, oh, the outcome of this mutation will be, it will make this gene as a recessive gene. Yeah. On the other hand, what's, in one, on what occasion any mutation of the gene will make this gene as a dominant? Let's take another example of a car. Accelerator in this case. Accelerator. Uh, sometimes it happens, actually. It's an unfortunate a real uh, life uh, example of what happened. And once again, let's consider that you have two, two accelerators working on as a de uh, deployed individual in your car. Okay. One accelerator is working normally. The other one, got crazy, so it's got flowed down. You, everybody drew, uh, yeah, everybody has a car, right? So you drive uh, every day. No? You don't have a car? Oh. You step on your uh, gas. 
gas pedal accelerator, and then it will pop out again once you uh, put your foot out of your accelerator. It will just go uh, return to normal position. But sometimes this accelerator uh, is out of order, so that it got slowed down. So once you push uh, the accelerator pedal, and then it doesn't pop up again. It just got slowed down, and then it just keep going. That is actually the real life uh, example of some particular example of this accelerator malfunction. What happened? If you, while you are driving, this happened and you are doomed. You have normal working copy of accelerator, but it doesn't help. Why? Because the malfunction you have now is something totally new. It's not something related with your normal function of accelerator, but something new. So whenever your mutation creates some new function of this gene, this existing working normal copy of gene cannot do anything to stop this. So in that case, that mutation or trait will become dominant. Or, or some other occasion is this function, new mutation will have some of the interference of existing function. That's another example of uh, the trait can become dominant. So anyway, this all functional thing, automatically, simply, uh, simplistic way of distinguishing this uh, recessive versus dominant is, if you lose your function, it will become recessive. If you gain a new function, it will become dominant. But there are two ways of gaining new function. One is totally new function. Another new function is simply existing function is like interfered due to this interaction that happens sometimes. For example, how can you interfere with new existing function? Imagine this sickle cell anemia uh, similar hemoglobin mutation. Hemoglobin work as a four uh, proteins component, four subunit. And let's say one subunit has a malfunction due to mutation and presence of this uh, structure, the mal structures copy will interfere the other copies of a structural uh, integrity so that entire whole function is now uh, stopped. You can easily imagine. It is an imaginary scenario, but it can happen. So that's where we can consider such an interference of a function due to a mutation. Okay, uh, although I'd like to go further but it's already 7.40, so I, I better stop uh, here. And for the rest of the things, I will try to pick up uh, the remaining two weeks, I guess. So see you next week, and have a good weekend.